Hello and welcome to Always Take Notes. In this episode, Eleanor and I spoke with Anne Goldstein, the translator of the Elena Ferranti novels. Anne spoke about her relationship with Ferranti and uh, how they talk about the translating process. She talked about the difficulties of translating the Ferranti novels and she also talked about her day job as the head of copy uh, at The New Yorker. It's a really great interview and we hope you enjoy it. So we're here with uh, Anne Goldstein, who we're speaking to via Skype. Um, Anne, it's really great to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much for, for taking the time. Yes, thank you. I was wondering if, uh, as a first question, you could tell us a bit about when when it became clear to you that the, the Ferranti novels were going to be the massive hit that they, they turned out to be. Was there a particular moment or a particular time when it was clear that they were just, just exploding? I think um, it's usually uh, dated to the, the publication of the third volume. Okay. Um, there was, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't really know. I, I it was never clear to me, but <laughs> I think that's when it sort of happened. There was a sort of, you know, a t- sort of tipping point, um, when the third volume came out and suddenly people were really couldn't wait for the next one. <laughs> so you had no idea when you were translating the first that, that it would become so popular? No, or not, popular a, at not all. at all. Not at all. I mean, I think as, particularly as a translator, I mean, you never think that you're, that something that you're working on is going to be um, a hit, so to speak, a bestseller. I mean, translated books just don't become, generally become bestsellers. Well, there are some exceptions, of course. But, um, you, you know, you just, it's just not part of what you're thinking about. <laughs> is, is there another a sort of world of translation of, you know, people who translate very commercial stuff, you know, whoever's translating Dan Brown or Tom Clancy or, or something like that? I mean, is, is that a completely different world from from the sort of literary translation universe that, well, that you've operated I think that, I think that what the different world is the fact that, that many books are translated from English into other languages, oh. whereas not so many books are published, um, are, are translated from other languages into English. I mean, the, the figures are something like, you know, 50 or 40, 50, 60% of books in Europe um, and other markets, I guess, also Asian, are, are translated from English, whereas... Um, I'm sure you've heard this um, other percentage books translated into English are about 3%. Wow, I, did, I hadn't heard those numbers before, but that is a, mm. an incredible kind of ratio difference. Yeah, right. So, so and what was the process for translating the novels? Because I've read them and Naples in particular is a huge, you know, an integral part of the story and almost feels at points like a character in itself. You know, it's so interwoven, um, the environment is so interwoven into the story. Did you visit Naples before translating? Did you spend time there? How important was kind of integrating yourself in the area? Um, Well, I had been to Naples, but many years earlier. And the truth is I didn't go to Naples while I was working on the novels, I mean, it, it would have been, I would have loved to, but <laughs> there wasn't, the time frame of the, of the translation was very tight. Um, they had to be done, um, again, you know, this is sort of unusual, I guess. <laughs> I mean, the, they, they wanted them to come out exactly a year, um, each volume a year after the, after it was published in Italy. And, um, and therefore there was sort of a short lead time. I mean, when she had actually finished but they were published, let's say, in September. I forget what year they started, 2011 maybe or 2012. And then the other, the, the English version had to come out immediately the year following. So that means, you know, if you count the time that for, um, pub, for publishing, I mean, the, the translation didn't, there wasn't that much time to work on the translations. Right, yes, of course. That was, that was a very convoluted way of explaining that. <laughs> could, could we roll back a bit to your, your kind of beginnings as a translator? We were reading online that, that it began in, in the late 1980s when you and some colleagues at The New Yorker took Italian lessons. Is that right? Yes. Well, we, we decided, I had had this ambition really for since college to um, read Dante in Italian. Okay. And I finally... Um, Again, this was well. This was some years later. Um, we, um, I convinced some of my colleagues at the New Yorker that this would be a good idea. So we, um, another colleague of mine, Mary Norris, was studying Greek at Columbia, and one of her classmates uh, was Italian, or her mother was Italian. Anyway, she came, and she came to the New Yorker, and we had this Italian class, um, 
and that's how uh, that's how I started really. And they were paid for by the New Yorker these classes. It, they were because in those days employers were far more enlightened than they are now, and they would pay for all kinds of different um, classes because rightly they they believed that it was um, useful to what really whatever your job was. In this case, we were copy editors, fact checkers. I mean, to have to take a class in, in almost any subject is going to be helpful to you in your work. And were you studying uh, medieval Italian or were you studying contemporary Italian? No, we, we, learned, we learned regular Italian, I mean, normal contemporary Italian, but, and then we did go on to read Dante. I mean, Dante is, um, well, have a, we have an Italian, we, the Italian class actually with some um, interruptions has been ongoing since 1986, I think. Okay. <laughs> but um, anyway, um, who says that, you know, Dante is, it's actually not that different from modern Italian in certain ways. So it's not and, like reading Chaucer in English? Or no, it's like not really. I don't think so. No, no, not at all. And also, I mean, I had read, I, I mean, I had, I knew French and Latin, which also, I guess, was a big help. <laughs> Um, but still, you can you can understand Dante to an extent. And and why did uh, kind of the powers that be settle on paying for Italian lessons for you and your colleagues? Was there we a, just, a toss up with we, another language that might be useful? No, we just we just um, that's just what we asked. We we just wanted to. I mean, my friend, um, I mean Mary Nars, who was studying Greek, was also her Greek classes were paid for. Um, so they paid for a lot of different kinds of classes. And they never you know, do that now. Like, no. They stopped in, I forget when they stopped in the 90s, I think. And what, or, what kind of investment of time were you doing when you were, when you were kind of ab initio? Was it an hour a week? Or, I mean, and how long did it take to get to a level where you felt you, know, you, felt you could translate? That, a level till I felt what? That I could, that, that you could translate. I mean, how... how oh, much... that was, it was completely accidental, and I think you'll probably find them for most translators. Um, well, we, we, no, our, I mean, I, our Italian class was like, it was an hour a week. As, okay. And, we, we had to, we did some, you know, I guess we had some minor homework, but, you know, after all, we weren't in school, <laughs> yeah. but, um, but I just started translating. I mean, the reason I started translating was just really out of curiosity and out of, um, I just, you know, it was sort of just to see how it would, what it would be like. It wasn't that I felt I was able to, you know, that my Italian was at a certain point. I just, um. And how, I mean, how is your, for example, your spoken Italian? Is that? It's not. No, it's not. It's not like my written. I mean, my reading Italian is much better than my spoken Italian. I've never really lived in Italy. I mean, I've spent a lot, a lot of time there, but I've never. Um, and how, never I mean, do, do, do you focus? I suppose if you're translating, is everything on the reading? I mean, do you, how? What level do you write at, for instance, in, in Italian? Uh, I write. I mean, I you can, can write yeah. pretty well. Yeah. I mean, I, I actually, I sort of wrote a book in Italian. <laughs> okay. Um, Could you tell and, us about that? Um, well, yes, it was. It's called the Lezione Primo Levi. It's a um, it's a book about it's it's the the Primo Levi Center in Turin. Um, well, maybe I should back up. Um, I am the editor of the complete works of Primo Levi in English, mm -hmm. and then I translated three of the books. But I worked closely with the Primo Levi Center in Turin, and every year they have a um, they have what they call lezione, a lecture about Levy, some aspect of Levy. So the year of the that the um, the complete works came out in English, I gave I with another person, um, a colleague, we gave the the lecture on the, the language and on the translation. So I, I actually so I I wrote in Italian this essay. I mean I wrote it in English and and I wrote it in Italian, but um, this essay on on Levy. When, when you translate, what, what is the process? What tools do you use? Do you use online help? Do you use, you know, just an old fashioned dictionary or do you not um, rely on anything and you just get a quick first draft out and, and, and then go back and fill in the gaps? No, I use I use a ton of dictionaries. I mean, I use I mean, I, I can't imagine um, in the past translators um, working without who worked without without online. I mean, I use um, several online dictionaries. Um, the first draft is very, I do do a very rapid first draft, but it's, um, but I use, I look up, I do look, I look up words. I mean, I don't spend a long time searching things out, but I, but I definitely um, use dictionaries and I sometimes, and I have paper dictionaries that I also use. Um, and I use different kinds of dictionaries. I mean, I use 
Italian English, um, Italian Italian synonym dictionaries, um, various other types of things. Um, how big an issue is was dialect as well? I mean, in terms of how much of the novels in the original are written in dialect as opposed to standard Italian? Not um, very little. She basically okay. Ferrante doesn't really write in dialect. When she said, when when you read in English, he said in dialect, or she said in dialect. In Italian, it says "di se in dialetto." Okay. He said, in, and then she goes on to write in in um, standard Italian. Um, the, I mean, I, there's various speculations about why. I mean, I think um, a lot of Italians wouldn't understand Neapolitan, and she has. I'm sure you've probably read in interviews. She's often said, you know, she wanted to be read. Um, also, I think another reason might be that that a Neapolitan is sort of a private. It's not. It, it is. I mean, it, there is a literature, but it's also a sort of. Um, more personal, but it's a very much a spoken language. Oh uh, yeah, I was going to ask: Does it have a written form? It does. Yes, there's there are. Um, it does. It has a literature. Um, I mean, I don't know Neapolitan. I, I, I. Um, another thing that I've done is translate the screenplays for um, HBO, not yeah. for publication, but um, and the, the screenplays for the HBO series, for the Rai HBO series. Um, are written in di- those are written in dialect because the series is in dialect. I don't know if you've seen them. That's very, but, that's, that's very interesting. I hadn't seen that, but I was talking. Um, my brother's partner is French, and she was complaining to me about Marseille, which is a, a Netflix property, oh, French language uh-huh. Netflix property. And she was saying, yeah, it's all. I mean, it's real like marquee French actors in it, but they don't have Marseille dialects. You know, so it, it's kind of oh. it's sort of interesting how it panned. Look yeah, well, the the Ferrantes are um, the um, my brilliant friend is all in di- is the speaking is all in dialect, and um, so I sort of have to had to learn. A, I mean, some some the early screenplays were in Italian, and then they were translated into dialect. Lately, they haven't even been translated into Italian. I mean, they haven't even been; they've just been dialect. So I've had to brush up my dialect a little bit. Um, <laughs> but um, what do you think of the series? The, I I liked it. Um, I'll just want to say I'll just say one more thing, but which is that in Italian, in the Italian versions, the dialect has subtitles in Italian. So in in I think 2016, you told the Atlantic that you hadn't actually um, corresponded directly with Franta yet. Um, you kind of corresponded through her publishers. Has that changed? Have you now been in direct contact or indeed met her? No. I almost no. I don't know who she is. I haven't met her. I mean, as far as I know, I haven't met her. Um, <laughs> And I um and I I do correspond through the publishers, yeah. And you don't know if she's read your translations. No, I mean I th- I'm pretty sure she read the first um the first translation, which was the Days of Abandonment. Uh, but after that, I'm not sure that she that she did. Uh, and what kind of level is your correspondence with her at? I mean, are you are you going back and forth about nuance and stuff like that, or is it is it pretty hands off? No, it's pretty hands off. I mean, I think in the um, the Guardian pieces, there was a bit more back and forth just because they were, um, there were they had to be done. You know, they were usually on deadline, yeah. and uh, they were kind the kind of writing that was much more um, compressed. And and as you were writing these novels, is there anything you would have done differently? Sorry, translating them. Is, uh, would you have? <laughs> do you have an itch to change anything? No, not really. Not in, not in these novels. No, I I was um, I went along with the author <laughs> completely. When when did Italian standardize as a as a language? Because again, I, I I think you know that dialects like Etruscan and sort of stuff like that. <laughs> so when when did the standardized form work? And is it you know like with English where the, the sort of upper classes across Italy would speak a similar form, but the regional dialects would be lower classes or how, how does that, I mean, when, when we say Italian, what, what do we kind of mean in that sense? Well, I mean, what's usually said is that, um, that radio and television were what standardized Italian because Italian, I mean, Italy wasn't even in a a country until the 19th century, late 19th century. Sure. And so it was made up of all these little, um, I mean, little places that had their own, their own language really. I mean, they're, you know, when, when Italians talk about dialect, I mean, they're really talking about languages. I mean, they're related, but, um, but they're not like, well, even like English, 
um, accents or I, I don't know. It's more of their actual languages. How um, how kind of draining or bizarre has it been being kind of the public face? of instead of um Brandy because obviously no one knows who she is and there was this kind of hunt to find out her identity with yeah. a lot of people coming to you and trying to find out through you and how, was that difficult well the well fortunately since I I really don't know who she is so I could I can I can honestly say no to to anybody who asks me um and I think that's kind of a good position to be in <laughs> but did you uh, have journalists who are trying to you know um reveal her identity coming to you no not really not really I mean yeah I mean the other part of the question of, of what you know being the public face of Ferrante of course is a is a very strange um position to be in but um but since I don't know who she is and I don't really know anything about her any more than what she writes um I can't really speak for her what did you think of this desire to know her real identity do you think it was unfair or do you think it was justified no, I I, th- I think that she should that if she wants to not be public, she should be allowed not to be public. I I do th- I think that this kind of hunting hunting for it and the speculation is it's unnecessary. I mean, here's as she herself says, you know, the books are there. Did you get uh, a sense of where that desire for anonymity had come from originally? Because I mean, it predates her fame and things, right? She's always yes, absolutely under, under those terms. Right. Her first novel, um, La Mori Molesto, Troubling Love, was published in, I think, 1992. Yeah. Uh, and right in the, I, I, you've probably read The Frontumalia, where she, there's a letter to the publisher where she says right away, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do anything for this book yeah. because I want to be public. Um, and I think in the beginning, she just um, felt that she wanted her privacy for whatever reasons. And I think, you know, as time went on, it became a somewhat also a, of a political statement in the sense of of feeling that that it shouldn't this whole the market the author as the being marketed was something that she just didn't want to do and didn't believe in and I know other other writers have some have said you know um, I wish I had done that <laughs> but you really can't you, it's really hard to avoid these days and Shall we talk a little bit now about your role at The New Yorker? So, or or even before that, you began your career as a proofreader for Esquire, for US Esquire, is that right? What what was that like, working for Esquire, I think, was it the 70s? It was this, um, yes, it was the 70s. I mean, it was, it was, proofreading um, is, in a way, especially what what I was doing at Esquire was really, was like the end, the the last um, thing that was done to the article, to articles, you know, before they went to press. So you're really sort of um, in a little bit of an isolation booth, <laughs> um, just reading, just reading proofs. It was, I mean, I, you know, I was young. I had just come to New York. It was really, it was kind of a, it was a good job. I mean, it was a good job. How, how did you get that job? What, where were you before? I was, I got that job through the New York Times. I, there was in in those days, people advertised, there were job ads in the New York Times, and there was an ad for a proofreader at Esquire, and I got the, and I applied and got the job. I mean, in, in the world of magazines, there's often today a sort of great nostalgia for, you know, for that period, maybe a bit earlier as well, the 60s, but when budgets were fat and pieces were long and, and stuff like that. Could you, as someone yeah. who, you know, who was there, and it, but has also mm-hmm. been in that environment more uh, re- much more recently, could you give a sort of unvarnished perspective of like what what was good in those days and what what maybe wasn't so good? You know, without without rose tinted spectacles, as it were. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, of of course, you know, you look back and think things were better in those days. No, they weren't necessarily better, but they were very different. I mean, there wasn't, but but the world was very different. I mean, there yeah. wasn't this this um, need. Well, really, now I think urgency and need to keep up with the news. I mean, people had. You, you had months to work on a to work on a story. I mean, you didn't have to. You, it didn't have to be done, assigned today and and in tomorrow. Um, it was just it was people worked on. Um, and, and the New Yorker in those days, well, in the seventies, I guess, and eighties, in the the William Shaw New Yorker, I guess I should say, mm. uh, writers um, often worked for months on on pieces. Writers generally chose what they wanted to work on. Um, something they were interested in. 
Mr. Sean, there was a one person, Mr. Sean, who approved or disapproved <laughs> of their, of their, um, um, of their top of their subjects. And, and they just wrote, I mean, I can, you can say that, well, in some ways, you know, people were indulged, writers were indulged and they were allowed to write too much or too long. Um, but they also were, I mean, you know, can you imagine like all the, the many geology parts of, of the geology pieces of John B now? I think it would be pretty hard. Were, were you at Esquire when Michael Hare was doing his Vietnam stuff? Or was that earlier? No, I think, I don't, I think that must have been earlier. That was earlier. Okay. Um, yeah, I was only at Esquire for a year. Okay. So I, and I was very um, dull. What have you <laughs> noticed um, over the years in terms of the quality of, of writing, in terms of attention to kind of grammar and correct use of language, has it slipped? Um, well, of course. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that people aren't, people don't, uh, you know, of course I'm going to say this, but I also think it's probably true that, um, you know, people don't really study grammar much. Mm. And, um, and it's, there's not really an emphasis, such an emphasis on it. I mean, you know, people do know it. I mean, I, I've been hiring proofreaders for a long time. And um, yeah, there was, there's people seem to know, know less, but people also have an instinct for it. Some people just have an instinct for it. And you can see that they just need to be, you know, know learn a few rules or something. <laughs> so we, um, we interviewed last week, uh, Ed Caesar, the, the magazine writer who Oh, to yeah. New Yorker. Although oddly, you'll actually go out in advance of him due to the, the way this, this all works. But but he recalled with great affection being in a closing conference at the New Yorker and you asking with great ceremony whether it would be okay to move a semicolon. And he, he said that this okay. was a, you know, he recalled this as a sort of fantastic example of the level that that work is, is done to. But, yeah. you know, is your view that, you know, this stuff, this stuff does really matter down, down to the position of... Well, yes, I do. I do. Yeah. I actually do think it matters. I mean, I think that's you know, um, good writing is dependent on small things, really, um, on, a, on an attention to detail. I mean, sort of, it's like translation. I mean, you, you really have to pay attention to what the author is saying to in order to bring it into the other language. And similarly, I think that with writers, I mean, you want to, you want them to express themselves as well as they can. And I think that that punctuation or, or the choice of words is, is important. And that there's, you know, if the difference is that there's not the time, there's not as much time now to deal with those things. Can you talk us through the process at the New Yorker from when you are, when you first get given a piece to work on to when you give it back to the editor and you have this closing meeting? Oh, <laughs> it's very complicated. I mean, the, the piece, a piece that comes in a manuscript goes first to an editor. The editor works on it. it it's assigned to a fact checker. Um, the legal, the, the lawyer reads it, um, probably the editor in chief reads it, um, David Remnick. Um, and, um, then it's, um, let's say it's put into type and in the process of it's being, when it's first put into type, we have people called what we call copy editors, um, what the New Yorker calls copy editors who do very basic things of styling, punctuation and spelling. Is that different then, from what the New York Times would call a copy editor? Well, the New York Times, I don't know. They got rid of them, haven't they? The New York Times. They, they got they, rid of yeah. all their copy editors. So they now have people that are, I think, editors, checkers, and copy editors all in one. Okay. Um, they did used to have real copy editors, but their copy editors did um, what what we, the people that that the New Yorker calls, um, actually calls okayers. Um, so the, that we, once the piece has been set up, we call set up and put into galleys, into type. Um, then someone called an okayer reads it. It's what we call first read. There was a famous copy editor at the New Yorker called Eleanor Gould, and she used to read really everything in the magazine except for the fiction and the poetry. But um, anyway, so there's like a first read in which, um, which is can be fairly heavy depending on the writer, um, in in which we we uh, fix the grammar, we fix the spelling, we fix the punctuation, we query. Um, that things make sense, that, that there's a logic that the, I mean, whatever you can think of sort of line, what you, what other people would call uh, line editing, mm. then that goes back to the editor and the editor decides, um, which of those, everything is in the form of a query. So the editor will decide which of these things he wants to, he or she wants to, um, accept 
sometimes with the writer, sometimes without the writer, then it's this process, then it's the piece could be, have the checking added and, and any legal comments and um, the writer of course can rewrite. Then when it gets onto the actual closing schedule, it's read again by the okayer and a second reader as well. And, and are you tired yet? <laughs> no, no, well, I was going to ask, particularly when when Sam was talking about the the place of the semicolon. Say, you know, Ed or the, any writer had said, "Well, I disagree with where mm-hmm. you want to put my semicolon." Who has the final decision with that? For something well, as small as... I mean, you know, we come to an agreement. <laughs> no, no, the writer. I mean, yes, the writer. I, I would say that the writer has the final decision, but unless the writer's wrong. <laughs> I was wondering if we could, we could sort of zig from the New Yorker back to translation for a moment, because I was, you know, <laughs> interested if, you, you know, you spend your, a lot of your time is in this world of, you know, making sure everything's absolutely correct and so forth, but obviously in, in fiction, those rules are different. And I was wondering how important is kind of quote-unquote accuracy in in literary translation. And I, I was interested in just one, one particular word that came up while I was, I was reading My Brilliant Friend, and mm-hmm. the, you, the use of the word females and the use of the word women, and that in some contexts, you know, I think there's a line of like, all the females were looking out, the big and small were looking out of the window. And I'm wondering, like, is that a distinction in, in the Italian? Or is that where you, you know, you made that, I, that call? I can't, I don't know. I don't know. I can't answer that. Okay. <laughs> because I don't know what the, it would ha- I'd have to look at it. Yeah. At the passage. If you want to send me the passage, no, I, well, I, mean, I suppose maybe in the broader sense. I mean, how how important is you know word for word accuracy? Do you think? Well, you can't really. You you sort of can't translate word for word. I mean, it's not. It wouldn't sound like English. Okay. I mean, the important thing is to remember is that you want the finished book to sound like, not necessarily that it was written in English, but that it is in English. <laughs> yeah. Because it to... came up with um, when we had Jennifer Croft on a few weeks ago. That oh yeah, we, I we, to that. we were discussing like the different notion of what is good writing in in different languages. You know how mm-hmm. how that distincts. And she also mentioned the the serious differences in editing between. You know, she said that like Spanish novels aren't really edited. You know, certainly not in not right. in the American way. How no, what, what happens the in novels in, aren't in, either. Okay. Really. I mean, some some are, some aren't, but generally, I would say there's not the kind of editing that there is in in American or English publishing. Do you think that's a good thing? No, I mean, I think <laughs> that it. <laughs> no, I think editing is really useful. Well, um, why do you think that is? Is it just a kind of cultural thing? Or because I suppose what what springs to my mind when you describe that extraordinary system at the New Yorker is, you know, it's it's a resource intensive operation, right? To have all those. Right. Yes, it oh, is. And, and it's, 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 and it's also very time intensive. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think one of the things you were talking before about what had changed over the years is that the cycle is much faster. Mm-hmm. I mean, things, things have to be processed much more quickly. So there isn't the, the time to really pay all that much attention, pay as much attention as you might like to something that, that we used to have in the, in, in olden days. Um, but I, I I don't know why books aren't aren't translated. I mean, aren't aren't edited so much. I mean, not not that they aren't at all, but not so much. I think. Um, and once or twice we've um, with Europa, we edited a book in the for the English version mm-hmm. that we thought was that we thought was too long, <laughs> or that just had some some part that was um, extraneous. But the editor and I agreed that we that we should, and and the author agreed too. But. And you've you've um, witnessed four different editorships at the New Yorker. Has anything changed dramatically in the copy department um, as these editors have passed you by, or has it remained? Well, we've tried to same? keep it. I mean, we've tried to keep our um, many levels of of reading, and um, but um, but you know, as I say, it's it's been it's become a little bit more complicated because of the because the everything happens much more quickly. I mean, when I started, there was there were no computers, for example. So with a, and when, once people started working on computers, they could revise much more. And, you know, every time you revise, you know, things change. Um, mistakes are introduced. No, <laughs> but, um, but in the old days, yeah, you, the, the, it was a much slower, the whole process was slower. So how long would you spend on a piece now versus then? Well, you, you would, if, if you, let's say you're, I mean, it's not, it, it, 
they're not, not all pieces are like this, but I think that, um, that if, if you, if you have a, for example, a political piece and you want it to be timely, the, there might be, um, things, it might be changing really up until it goes to press. So you, let's say there's an insert that goes in at the last minute. Well, that you could say, well, you don't have time to really work on that insert and make sure it's works well and all that. I mean, that's an extreme example. And, and when the internet came along and, and stories started being published online, how, what were the kind of discussions that were going on internally at the New Yorker about how those very rigorous editorial processes could or should, or even whether it was possible to take that across to a well, digital we, publisher? We, we tried in the very beginning, but it was clear that it was just impossible because the demands of the web are um, quantity in a way rather mm. than quality. I mean, I'm sure someone will shoot me for saying that. No, but um, but it's um, no, but it's true. I mean, it that's that's just what they need. They need to they need to keep um, renewing their pieces, and so they're they're always looking for writing, and there there just isn't time to. Um, I mean, there is copy editing done, of course. Uh, there's copy editing and there's fact checking too, but you don't have as much time to do it. You I mean, said things have to go immediately onto, you know, they have to be posted right away. Is that the reasoning then behind, I think you um, said in an interview in 2016 that the writing at the New Yorker isn't as good as it isn't always as good as it used to be. Did you mean in terms of style or in terms of, you know, everything, content? Well, I think, I think everything. I mean, it's, I, I don't mean that it's not as good. There are still some really good writers. Um, I think that, um, that, that in a way, writing, good writing is less important. Literary quality is less important now. I mean, it's natural because it's, because the New Yorker has become much more, um, much more timely. You know, things, things are, it's, it's much more about what's, you know, things that are important right now. And so there isn't, um, time for people to perfect their literary style or what something. Is, what is the, the scale of the operation? How many people work on the editorial side, and, and, and how many oh, how many staff writers are there? Because I understand that like staff writer is a sort of flexible term in terms of someone who might do yes. a piece, piece it like is a flexible. year. Or, you know, I, I really don't know. I I don't know. I mean, you know, in my department when I left, we had, there were twenty, there were maybe twenty people, sure. counting full and part time people. But the but the web, I don't know how many people there are in the web. The web has expanded in the, in the last two years. The web has expanded hugely, sure. and I. I don't even know how to even describe it. Um, and we've, you know, we've tried to sort of integrate the copy departments, like have our people work on web copy and web people um, work and work on print sometimes. I mean, because even though I'm saying, well, we don't really have as much time as we used to. Of course, we have way more print has way more time than the web to work on things. Um, you've edited some, you know, pretty famous writers. You've edited Janet Malcolm, John Updike. Um, Adam Gopnik, what, when you think back to some of the your favorite pieces, your most memorable authors, writers that you've copy edited, are, are there any kind of very? Do you ever think fondly onto their their quirky errors or a, a quirky style that you would that would often be quite unruly to to edit? No, I mean I you know how can I? It's impossible not to say that that John Updike was an amazing person to work with because he did well actually all those writers um but uptake i mean i um in particular they all all had um were very careful writers and uptake he really was interested in you know whether you were going to put the semicolon here or there uh, many writers are not you know don't don't get involved in that and that's good in some cases. Um, one thing we, we always ask about on the podcast um, with everyone is, is money and the financial side of writing. And certainly when we spoke to Jennifer a few weeks ago, she was like, no one ever makes any money translating. Um, and, you know, That's she right. had sort of pieced her, her yeah. life to go with grants and things like that. Did, did you, yeah. I suppose, you know, we're British, so we're very reticent at talking about money, but did you make a lot of money from the translations? And did you, did it, how did it kind of work on, on that side? Well, in general, um, she's right. I mean, translators make no money. I mean, the, the translate. I think it's it may be better in in England than it is in America, even. Um, but um, but the yeah the the pay is very small, and you have to have you really basically have to have another job to support your habit. 
<laughs> do you get a do you get a royalty though? Or is I it, do, is it, yeah. but but the Ferrante was an exception because yeah. I, I I used to get. I mean, I I just had royalties written into my contracts. Um, I don't know when I started doing that, not with the expectation that I would ever get any royalties, but just just as a kind of you know sign of respect or something. <laughs> you know, just on just on on principle, you know, you want royalties in the contract, and you know they're very small, but yeah, but the Ferrante, there's yeah, there was some royalties, <laughs> so it was kind of amazing. That's good to hear. Yeah, but it, but I just should emphasize that it's very unusual, and that people do have to have you you sort of it's very hard to make a living just as a translator. And you've translated um, twenty or, or more authors now. How do, do you have? Do you ever pitch to translate a certain author, or do they always come to you? Um, they've actually all come to me. I've been incredibly lucky, uh, and and they've all been. I mean, almost every author that I've translated has been um, really great. I mean, they're you. First of all, you can. There's no. I mean, I, I think that anything you translate is, is useful and good for your, and it's always interesting, even if you don't like it, it's, it can be, it's interesting and, and you learn something, but I've been like, I've was, liked most authors. <laughs> I was wondering when, when I um, read the, my brilliant friend, I, the novel that really, or not novel piece of writing that really came to mind to me was Naples 44 by Norman Lewis. Oh yes. And I, love and I was wondering what your thoughts are on, on how, you know, an, an Italian or a kind of indigenous, for want of a better word, writer will write about their culture as opposed to how a, you know, an expatriate witness. I mean, I, I, I found Naples 44 was a wonderful book and Adam, um, I'm trying to remember his name, but uh, Adam Folds, uh, the English poet wrote a novel which yeah. was kind of drawn on it a few years huh. ago as well. Um, I mean, I, I thought it wasn't that successful because Naples 44 is so amazing and you can't rewrite mm -hmm. it. Um, but, you know, what, what do you think is different about, you know, an Italian writing about Italy and, uh, and a, a non-Italian doing it? Oh, gosh, that's a very hard question. <laughs> I mean, the people like, like um, it, the Naples 44 and um, another um, British or Australian author who writes about Naples... Um, Shirley Hazard, they're, they are writing about it from their experience mm. of being particular and, and in, at a particular time. Shirley Hazard also writes about right after the war, a little bit later, perhaps then. Um, um, but um, I, I don't know. I mean, I think it's hard to say. There's a um, book by um, a writer called Curzio Malaparte called La Pelle, which is also about Naples right after the war. And it's it's kind of great. Um, I don't know how I would say it's diff well, it's different just because, but it but it has all the same types of characters and um, and difficulties. Uh, I I don't know. I guess I can't really answer that question. But when we I mean, or or just take take um, Ferrante. I mean, she's there's someone writing about Naples from as an Italian. Of course, Neapolitans would say she's not really. Um, you know, oh, she's not right, and she's not, she's giving a negative picture and all that, so I don't know. When we spoke to Jennifer Croft, um, she obviously loves her job as a translator, but she was quite cynical about the profession and said, you know, I, I wouldn't recommend it as a career choice to mm -hmm. anyone up and, cut, you know, younger mm -hmm. and coming through right now. Would you agree with her, or are you well, more optimistic? <laughs> No, I, I I would agree with her that it's not, um, you, you couldn't, it's very, as I said, it's very hard to make a career as a literary translator. I mean, if you you have to teach or, like me, you know, have some other kind of um, day job. And I, I, it's not that I wouldn't recommend it. I mean, I you would only recommend it if you have another way to make, to make a living. <laughs> yeah. I, Did you um, get a sense of, you know, Obviously, these things are incredibly hard to assess, and so many factors play them. But why the Ferranti novels became such a phenomenon? I mean, I was, you know, I hadn't read them before this interview, and I've only, I've only read the one. But I was, I was very struck by how, you know, how much there is about kind of envy in the books, and how, like, how complicated the relationship between two characters are, and how, like, really, you know, this is a really, it struck me as like a, a, a really unvarnished view of like you know, interactions between friends and between women as well. And, I, you know, do you think it is that sort of rawness that gave these books yeah. their huge appeal? 
And that's certainly part of it. I mean, I think just the the analysis of a women of a friendship, the friendship between two women in a very, yeah, and kind of a raw way and kind of a way of um, that's doesn't doesn't try to cover anything up, um, or that's that goes deep into into what everybody's feeling. I think um, that's part of it. I think that a lot of the, um, I mean, one of the reasons I think that they became so popular is that, I mean, it sounds sort of silly to say universal, but, but they are, um, even though they're very particular about Naples and about these, these characters, um, they are also about relationships that everybody, we all have. And I think that that's, there was something about the relationship, the descriptions of the relationships that, that appeal to people. There was a famous review or famous, um, I can't remember. I think it was in the London Review of Books by, um, oh, now I can't think of her, of her name. Anyway, Brit- a British um, writer saying, she sort of started out by by saying she was, she'd gotten together with some friends and they sort of got mixed up about what was their life and what was the life of Elena and Leela. So <laughs> it was, it was th- that there was that kind of um, identification, I think, with the characters. I felt what, what as I was reading all of them, I would kind of flip between who I was rooting for at different times, and in the I think I became more and more empathetic towards Leela, who was mm-hmm. at the beginning depicted as a kind of more unpleasant character. Did you find your yeah. alliance changing? No, because well, this is the thing. I mean, at least for me as a translator, I I really find it hard in a first person narrative not to take the 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 part of the first person narrator because you're so you know you're so involved in um in the book in the mm. in the process in the in the mind of the person of the i that that it's at least for me it's very hard to to um to to be more sympathetic to one of to another character somehow in terms of the the kind of physical look of the book the the cover and so forth we had um a while ago on the podcast we had laura barber the uh the head of granter books in, in london and she was saying uh-huh. you know they they have a kind of mission to publish translated fiction and when she started she was like look we're publishing this stuff like it's rivita you know like it's really kind of worthy and good for you but maybe a bit boring <laughs> and she wanted to do that differently in terms of how it looked and i'm also struck by how you know there are different cultures with this so you know french or german novels are often a lot sparer in the way that yeah covered mm-hmm. typography and, and things like that does does the do the english editions of the Ferrantes do they look like an italian novel or what they're the... exactly they're exactly they almost all, all all have the same cover as the italian version interesting okay. the novel yeah did you choose the titles in english well i did it in in consultation with um the people at europa and, and at Edizioni AO with the, the um, editors. And you were happy the, with, with, the, with the final result? Yeah, yes. I mean, they're, they're very close to the Italian. And That's in, not always possible. In, in the, the sort of pantheon of Italian publishing, where, do, where does Europa sit? Are they like a, a big major or are they an independent? Or No, well, Europa is actually an, um, the American or English language um, part of an Italian publisher called Edizioni AO, okay. um, who were was started in well, actually they're just about to have their 40th anniversary. But they they did a lot of um, when they started out, they did a lot of translations into Italian from Eastern European countries. So they they've always been a sort of you know translation has always been a big part of what they do. And when um, the owners um, Sandro and Sandra Ferri decided to that they wanted to also publish in English. It was sort of around like soon after 9-11 and they, they sort of felt it was a moment when there was interest in people in, in, you know, global things and people being interested in other cultures. So they were all already, I mean, they, they started out by wanting to, to do translations. And I think the first ones were, well, the days of abandonment was their first, was Europa's first book. And then, They've done a lot of French and German, and and now they do a fair number of, of um, English language books too. But it's sort of a it's not tiny like the tiniest publishing companies, but it's it's pretty small. So and to to finish off um, this very interesting conversation, you said that all you've been lucky enough to have all the work come direct to you. But is there any 
Italian author or other uh, from another nationality who you'd like to translate, if you could, and who you might no, reach out to? I, I, I don't know. No, not really. I mean, I, I, I know you'd think I would have a better answer to that question. But um, no, I mean, I, I just, um, it's, I seem to be kept interested <laughs> by Do you, um, do you turn happened. down a lot of work? Um, a fair amount. Not a lot, but occasionally, yeah. And, and why would you turn it down? Um, mostly because I don't have time. And sometimes because I'm not interested. There's a new, there's, I don't know if you've read about this, but there's an 800 page um, book about Mussolini. It's sort of a biography, fiction, novel. Um, and the it's projected to be three volumes, um, each one 800 pages. <laughs> oh, God. Is that kind of in the mold of that French book? Is it HHH that was about, um, oh. you know, that was kind of quasi novel, quasi, it's on my shelves, I haven't read it. Um, yeah, I, about I'm another sure. another prominent fascist. Uh, yeah, um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But um, but that's that was a book that although I actually would have been very interested in it, I didn't. I just didn't have time, and I and I couldn't have see. You, have you published nonfiction? Sorry, have you translated nonfiction yourself? Um, yes. Wait, what have I? Well, um, let's. Well, some. I mean, I don't know. The periodic table of Primo Levi is yeah. not is autobiography, I guess, or. Um, and some other, I've done some other books, um, which I can't think of offhand. We should, but we, yeah. should we should wrap this in a minute because we're against our, anyway. against our line. But we, I, I had one, one final question, which was kind of covered the two elements of your career. And there's, um, there's a Hemingway novel, I think, also set in, is it in Venice just after the war, across the river and into the trees? Isn't that the one that the New Yorker like famously panned in its description of the uh, writing? It was called like Across the Street and Into the Grill or something. It was some oh, legendary... I'm not sure. Legendary well, I, don't review I don't remember that oh, and I actually that's a novel I haven't read well it's not very good <laughs> so I think, you're, I think you're okay but look Anne thank you for, for being such a, a fascinating and candid guest yes and, thank you um, wishing you okay. all the very best with, with your project oh thank you very much hello it's us again um, we have a confession slash announcement to make in that a reader has informed us that our, our banter is inadequate so we're attempting to, to address that problem to address that problem we haven't well we, our producer told us to script our banter yeah, which well, i think was even more insulting i she know felt that we weren't able to we, have we could only work chat. like off off the page <laughs> yeah um so we've eschewed that decision so here is some genuinely spontaneous cringy banter um ellie how are you I am fine. Um, what have I been up to this week? Well, I have written my most embarrassing and nerdiest piece to date for The Telegraph about the... Is this more embarrassing than the one where you went to live in a shed? Did I live in a shed? I thought you, you scouted a shed. Oh, no, I went. No, I actually never went to see the shed. Oh, yes, this well, the, the London's shittest apartment for it's rent. potentially award-winning piece of journalism. Yeah, I, I, that was quite fun. Um, yeah, I was trying to write like Joel Golby and it didn't quite work, but that was the the aim because he does that kind of vice column where he scouts out mm. like London shitters properties anyway no I um was interviewing the question setters behind University Challenge okay so the real brains and they were as um particular as you might think presumably they're universally well-adjusted individuals fulfilling social lives <laughs> <laughs> they all spend their weekends perusing the um, research sections of public libraries and quote books. I would have thought that would have been rendered um, obsolete by the internet. Yeah, no, they don't use the internet. They use book dictionaries, Chaucer, um, what do they use? Oxford English Dictionary and Chambers uh, quote books. And yeah, just um, they go to a lot of conference. They, they get a lot of their questions from attending random talks on kind of niche philosophers and economists and things. Fascinating. I should um, say that um, Ellie's apartment is right underneath the flight path to some major London airport, so that's an aircraft. I have also been um, in the quiz world because uh, I'm writing this piece for Bloomberg Business Week about quizzes. Um, oh, pub quizzes. Pu well, pub quizzes, but also big quiz. So the corporate providers that are trying to edge out the artisanal quiz masters. So the lowbrow version of my piece, basically. I mean, yeah, <laughs> essentially. <laughs> essentially the listicle version of your yeah, piece. The BuzzFeed. Um, so that's that's what what I've been doing. So what's it like what, writing for Business Week? Uh, no, it's good actually. Although it's obviously the usual thing with an American publication, so you have to explain all the um, all the kind of baffling baffling elements of British society. 
Um, <laughs> we're having a, a current discussion about how to classify UK garage at the moment. Oh, really? The, yeah, yeah. Did Craig David come into it? No, it didn't. But I, I'd given a kind of elaborate definition, not entirely sourced from Wikipedia, saying that UK garage is based around a distinctive 4-4 rhythm. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that distinctly sounds from Wikipedia. Yeah. And this is this was then cut. And but but in the current edit, UK Garage described as classic rock, which it most definitely is not. No, you must correct that. I, I shall correct that. So oh, yeah, God. So we'll get. Was we'll garage get, not a thing in US? In I the think US? they had Speed Garage, but I think that's different. Well, I guess they never had grime. I'm touched and grime that you assume I'm an garage. expert on these issues. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Maybe that was wrong. Well, anyway, that's um, this week's banter done. Please. How traumatic was that, Simon? It'd be pretty awful. But we can work on it. <laughs> you I actually th- did look quite stricken at one point. I know. But I think now that we've acknowledged the problem. Anyway. This has been Always Take Notes, hosted um, by me, Simon Akam. And me, Eleanor Hall. Our producer is Nicola Keane. Our social media is handled by Zara Hankia. Our graphic design is by James Edgar. And our score is by Jess Danheiser. And if you want to find us on social media, we're always take notes on Instagram, take notes always on Twitter. And please do leave a review on iTunes uh, and also subscribe. But don't mention the banter. Um, or if you do, only lavish praise. Yeah. And also, if you'd like to give us some money on Patreon, we're at patreon.com slash always take notes. Thank you and goodbye. Bye.